Hello, my name is David Hewitt. I am one of the three pastors of Cruciform Bible Church, and I'm recording this lecture for a class for Cruciform Bible Institute. The lecture is titled Christians in Politics. I was asked by Brandon to give a lecture about the propriety and importance of Christians being active in the political realm. He did so, I think, because I have recently taken the a bit of a role in this myself. It is June of 2022, and last month in May, there was an election for the primary in the state of Indiana, and I was on the ballot. I was on the ballot as a candidate for state representative in the district where I happen to live, which is District 91 in southwest Indianapolis. It was definitely an experience, and there were difficulties and there were challenges that I'd never faced before, a busyness that I hadn't experienced in a very long time. But after all was said and done, the money spent, the challenges that we had to encounter and overcome, it was worth it because of the necessity of Christians who truly love God, who truly want to see just laws happen necessity that for us to come forward and to put our names in the hat, so to speak, that we might see righteous things done in our land. Because we desire laws that will honor God. And I'll be talking more about that here throughout the course of the lecture. Probably be about 30 minutes or so. Maybe a little longer. Depends on how quickly I speak, I suppose. Now, I also think that this is gained importance over the last few days. I am recording this lecture at the end of June, after the Roe versus Wade decision has been overturned in the United States. In fact, this is barely 24 hours after it happened, as I am recording this. And already, already, there has been massive protest. There have been many people on both sides sides of the abortion issue, I suppose we can call it. One side, of course, saying we need to outlaw the murder of the unborn, and the other saying they're going to do everything that they can in order to uphold it. More than ever, Christians need to be raising their voices to speak the truth in the public sphere, and through much prayer and consideration, put their hats or rather, you know, toss their hat in the ring, I guess. Let's use another another illustration. And rather tired of colloquialism, I suppose. That we might see righteous laws enacted. Having said all of that by way of introduction, I'll go to the notes that I have prepared. My favorite founding father of the United States is a man by the name of John Jay. John Jay was governor of New York. He authored some of the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were, in many ways, explanatory documents for the Constitution as it was being written. I believe uh, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison wrote most of them. But it was John Jay who contributed to it as well. He wrote a couple of them, I think. But John Jay was best known for being the first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Very relevant right now. He was known for referencing the Law of Moses in the decisions he made as justification for the decisions he made being truly just and righteous. My favorite quote from him is this. He once said, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty, as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation." to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. He believed that the nation was a Christian nation. More than that, he believed that God, by his providence, has given it to us. A Christian man who truly believed the working of God in and through all things. He also said it was in our best interest, since we have been given the privilege especially, and in our best interest, to select Christians for the rulers, and to prefer them for their rulers. I agree. We ought to do this. We should prefer Christian rulers. 
and it is a biblical conviction that we should do so. But why? Why is this? Well, let's see what the scriptures have to say about the matter. An important text to go to, I think, is found in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Micah 6, verses 6 through 8. And I will begin reading from the New American Standard Version of the Bible, 1995. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings and with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. The sacrificial system was required for the people of Israel. But Micah understood something deeper. What is required? What does God really want from us? By way of obedience, of course. He says, well, we ought to do justice. We ought to love kindness. We should walk humbly with God. To do justice. What does it mean to do justice? What are the areas in which we need to be doing justice? Surely in our individual lives. And the word has that the word has that denotation. We ought to do justly, to do righteously in our own actions, because God loves righteousness. When we sin, we have to confess and repent of that sin, turn from it, acknowledge that it is what God says it is, that it is evil. And we ought to do that which is right, also that which is right by His standard. When God says it's right. We ought to seek and desire and do good in our own lives. But it's not simply in our own personal lives in our individual effect. It's in our own individual families, perhaps I should say. But it also pertains to legal matters. We need to remember that the people of Israel, notably their rulers, were known for the opposite of this very frequently, the opposite of doing justice. And I'm going to have a look at uh, sorry, Amos chapter 5. Verses 14 and following, as an example. Amos 5, verses 14 and following. And now you get to wait for just a moment while I load a Bible program that I should have had open a few moments ago. <laughs> but it gives you an opportunity to turn there as well. This is what the text says. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Seek good and not evil, he says. Hate evil, love good, he says. Establish justice in the gate. That's verse 15. In the gate, the gate of the city. That is the place where decisions were made, where judgment was rendered. We see an example of this in the book of Ruth, with Boaz meeting at the gate of the town and calling people together so they could be witness to a transaction that was going to take place. That is where business was done, in many ways. Judgments were rendered there, and those judgments needed to be just. But they were supposed to establish justice there. In other words, it was known that they were doing just the opposite. So... This issue about doing justice is not just an admonition to pious living. Though, in many ways, it is that, but it is more. Furthermore, there's an admonition in Deuteronomy 16, which my friend John Jacob, who has been state representative for this area for the last couple of years, the district over from mine, solid Christian brother, a good friend, this is, and the text says this in Deuteronomy 16, verses 18 through 20. Deuteronomy 16, verses 18 through 20. You shall appoint for yourself judges and officers in all your towns, which the Lord your God has given you according to your tribes. And they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial. And you shall not take a bribe. 
For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall pursue. You may live and possess the land which the Lord your God has given you. Justice and only justice is what the text says. That's all you're going to pursue. And in what context is this? The first part of the text tells us, does it not? In verse 18, appoint judges for yourselves, officers in all your towns which the Lord your God has given you. These are to be rulers over certain groups of people. God's standard is true justice. And obviously, since these people were appointed as rulers over God's people, God's people had civil rulers over them. And of course, by necessity then, it was biblical for God's people to be active in the civil realm. It goes without saying that when God appointed people to be rulers over his people, or when he told his people to select rulers also for themselves, they were to do so from their own people, people who would do that which is right. Also, we ought to want justice to be done in the public realm, in the civil sphere. God's law is good. You don't have to go far in the scriptures to see that. The first five books of the Old Testament talk about God's law. He gave it, it is good. Paul testifies clearly in Romans 7 that God's law is good. And even in some of his other letters, law is good and lawful. Use it lawfully, he says. So, God's law is good. Obeying God's law does bring blessing. Now, I'm not saying that obeying God's law brings justification. Not at all. I'm saying that when a people is obeying the law of God generally, as opposed to disobeying it, there'll be generally blessing as opposed to cursing. Blessing in people's individual lives, blessing over a nation, rather than that nation falling into judgment and eventually being taken away. God's law is the standard for what constitutes righteousness. There is no other standard for righteousness. Also, given that Christians are the ones most likely to enact truly righteous laws, as well as uphold them, it follows from this that we would want Christians ruling. Which means Christians need to be involved in the political process. It simply follows. God's law brings blessing. Obedience to it is good. God's law is good. Christians are to love the law of God. And since that's the case, and since we want righteousness and justice done in the land, the Christians need to be the ones who are in the political process, getting elected and making decisions, uh, making, bringing laws into effect, even enforcing such laws. Otherwise, we're not going to have righteousness in the public sphere. Beyond that, we also show love for God by keeping his commands. John 14 tells us this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, Jesus said. We ought to want our nation to have laws that honor God because we love God and his law. It is the greatest commandment, is it not? To love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Setting aside the fact that we... Not setting aside that... Not spending too much time talking about the fact that we fail to do so on a daily basis and need confession and repentance. But that should still be our greatest aim, our greatest desire, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we ought to love his law. Obeying what he has said is one way that we show love to God. The issue comes up sometimes, and I think rightly so, well, this is a brief aside, that this nation in which we live right now is not a Christian nation, and it is true. And some have asked, well, how can then can you insist on having legislation that creates laws that are consistent with God's law, since you're not having a Christian people over which to rule? Well, two things can be given in answer to that. One has already been mentioned in part, that we want laws that truly are just, and anything less than that is not going to have a nation that is abiding by any sense of goodness at all. 
It will not bring the things that any society needs to survive. We won't have justice in gate. We won't have righteousness done in courts. We won't have police officers upholding truly just measures. It will devolve quickly, as it is in many areas across this nation, truly, into chaos, into disorder, and ungodliness. But there's more. And I think the Bible gives us a bit of an example of this. King Josiah is an important example. Josiah was king at a time in Judah's history when the people, by and large, were very wicked. And Jeremiah, as prophet, addressed this very much so. Jeremiah was prophet during a good portion of Josiah's reign and also the kings afterwards until God destroyed the nation and took and sent him into exile at the hand of the king of Babylon. But Josiah, having received the law of God, the book of the law of God, and having it, had it read to him, realized how evil the people had been, how evil a nation had been, and how many of the kings in the history of Judah had been, including his own father. So, after consulting with God through the prophet, he was bound and determined to obey what God had said. And as the king, he did so. More than anyone else before him, to be only to be compared with Hezekiah, did he go through the nation and make reforms, destroying idols, breaking up altars, refusing to have any worship other than the worship of the one true God. And it was good. God blessed him for it. He, God did tell him he was going to bring judgment because of the king Manasseh and his wicked ways. But God also told Josiah that he wouldn't do it in his lifetime. It was a reward for the obedience of Josiah. Now, were the people truly repentant? Were they truly desirous of following after God? No. They were not. And we know this because right after the death of Josiah, they went right back into the wicked, sinful, idolatrous practices that they had been doing beforehand. There was no true change of hearts in the hearts of the people. And that is necessary for true reform to happen in a society. The people have to be changed. The Spirit of God must work salvation, regeneration in the hearts of men. And this is what we pray for. It's what I pray for. However, upholding God's law still brings blessing. God bless Josiah for it. There was no judgment and upheaval in his time. But abandoning his law indeed does bring judgment. It brings destruction. We see that not just from what God had warned to Josiah, but far before this, when the law was still being given in the book of Leviticus, we see God warning his people about this very clearly. In Leviticus 18, 24 through 28, it says, Do not defile yourselves by any of these things. Very briefly, these things refers back to the previous 23 verses in the book in Leviticus chapter 18. There is a huge list of sins there. Most of them, terrible sexual sins. It includes bestiality. and includes homosexuality. Incest and other terrible things. All of them. It says, Do not defile yourselves by any of these things. For by all these, that is all these sins, the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. For the land has become defiled. Therefore I have brought its punishment upon it, so the land has spewed out its inhabitants. But as for you, you are to keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not do any of these abominations, neither the native nor the alien who sojourns among you. For the men of the land who have been before you have done all these abominations, and the land has become defiled. So the land will not spew you out, should you defile it, as it has spewed out the nation which has been before you. It's Leviticus 18, 24 through 28. The warning is clear. If you do the sinful practices that the people who lived in this land before you did, which is all the things that were listed in Leviticus 18, again, certainly unpopular to say in the United States these days, that includes homosexuality. If the people were to do those things, God would spew them out of the land. He would remove them. 
He removed the inhabitants of the land of Canaan before the Israelites came by the hand of the people of Israel. It was God's judgment against them. And by the way, this is an important side note about this passage. Many people, sadly sometimes even those who name the name of Christ, will say, well, that was then, this is now. We're talking about the law of God, and God gave the law to the people of Israel, and we're not under the law, we're under grace. And, of course, there are those who are going to say, we don't need to worry about what God has said. That's the Old Testament, and this is something that we can, we can just pass that off. In New Testament times. Or something along the lines of, do you eat shellfish? I've had that challenge more than a few times. Do you wear clothing that is woven of more than one kind of fabric? And the objection is obviously coming with regard to some of the dietary laws and the clothing restrictions that were found in the law of Moses that have that are rightly put under a civil, sorry, not a civil, but a ceremonial aspect of things. The people at that time were not to do these things because the nations around them did these things by means of showing themselves to be separate. But those sins aren't listed in Leviticus 18 if they were to violate those particular laws. No, Leviticus 18 talks about other things. It talks about the fact that there are nations that are completely destroyed because they were involved in wicked sexual sin. And the people that lived in the nation, or the, the land, I should say, before the people of Israel were wiped out because of these sins. No one ever sent a prophet to them. No one had given the law of God to them. They were not told any of these things. But yet, they were held accountable for them. Even without the law, and this is the point, even without the law, these were wicked, terrible sins. And God judged for them. That is, even without the law given, they were still unrighteous. And the people were judged. So, the applicability is simply this. For all peoples at all times. The sins listed in Leviticus 18 destroy the body as well as condemn. Homosexual activity destroys the body. As well as being a wicked sin that brings the judgment of God. So, what does that have to do with Christians in politics? Well, we've already talked about that we need to love God by wanting his law upheld. And it's noteworthy to say and point out that the next chapter in Leviticus is where we get this verse. It says, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That's Leviticus 19, verse 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. The second greatest commandment. The first, of course, being mentioned earlier, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself is the next greatest commandment both mentioned by Jesus in Matthew chapter 22. We ought to love our neighbors. We ought to love everyone. Of course, there is proper differentiation in kinds of love. We ought to love God most of all. We love our family members more than those who are not. I love my wife more than someone else's wife, for obvious reasons. But there is differentiation in love. Yet, the word of God is also clear that everyone is our neighbor especially those with whom we have contact. We ought to desire good for them. We ought to desire their protection. We don't want them to be destroyed. We don't want their belongings that God has given them to be taken by someone else. We don't want them to be killed unjustly. We don't want them to fall into destruction. And we don't want to see them judged either. We'd much rather see them saved. We'd much rather see them protected. And just laws, truly righteous laws, protect our neighbors. Truly just laws help keep our neighbors from destroying themselves and each other. From destroying themselves, as Leviticus 18, and protect them from one another, such as a law that would prohibit stealing and have appropriate just punishments for it. And related to what we talked about with Josiah earlier, truly just laws also help delay the judgment of God. If we love our neighbors, we shouldn't want them to face such judgment. Now, this is not the same as saying that we don't want God's judgment to be displayed against injustice, against wickedness. Of course we do. 
In some sense, we certainly do. When evil has taken place, we ought to want just punishments for it, as God has given us in his word. And there is the book of Revelation, which talks about the saints rejoicing when God's judgment is revealed against his enemies. His justice is done. Now please note this is not a bloodthirsty desire for massacre. This is the vindication of God's truth and his justice. That is the thing in which they rejoice. The vindication of their own lives for having honored God. That is what we're talking about. So, our desire should be for just laws. So that God is honored and his word and his laws he's given to it. And so that our neighbors are also loved and protected in the ways mentioned. It is our hope, of course, in prayer, as we work in both areas. We work in the area of the top-down from sacred King Josiah, and we desire righteous laws to be enacted and pray that God would work mightily while his judgment is held off to work in the salvation of people so that their hearts are changed. And we desire people's hearts to be changed as well, that there would be even better results in this area. And I would also add, it is far better when change happens in a society. Speaking of reforming a society, turning them back toward Christ, if the change happens from both sides, both ends. From the top, that is, from the rulers, and also from the bottom, the people individually being saved. Because if all you have is one or the other, destruction still happens. We saw what happens if all you have is the top, the ruler who is a godly man, who is acting righteously. Well, things we find under Josiah, at least better than they had been for a while, God's judgment was held off. But when he died, the judgment came in full force. Because there had been no change in the people, and therefore they had wicked rulers after that, and pe the people did not truly honor God, and God judged them. On the other hand, if it is only from the bottom up, the people being transformed, the word of God working through a society, people truly being saved, but yet the people in the positions of authority are not saved, and remain enemies of God. They're going to use their power and the sword, the sword that is given in Romans 13 to the civil authority, to do great persecution to the church as it grows. This has certainly happened in many places in history. And if God sees fit to bring that, blessed be the name of the Lord. At the same time, I say this for friends, I say this for my own children, I would rather they grew up in a society that loved Christ rather than one that is going to be seeking their own destruction because of the hatred of Christ by its leadership. So, by way of summary, and since we're approaching 30 minutes, we do want Christians involved in civil government because we want righteous laws enacted. We want Christians involved in civil government because we want to love God in all areas of life. Every single one. Because he's king over all. We want them enacted because showing love for God's law is a way we show love to God. Again, John 14. We want Christians involved in civil government because we wish to restrain evil behavior out of love for neighbors. We want Christians involved in civil government because we want to see God's judgment delayed as in the days of Josiah. And finally, we want Christians involved in civil government because we wish to do justice in such as a requirement of God from us. Again, my name is David Hewitt, one of three pastors of Crucible and Bible Church. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this brief lecture. May God bless you and work in us all, that his name would be honored across our society and every society.